we'd like to introduce to you our third and final presentation of today. The Birth and Foster Parent Partnership, also known as BFPP. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, but members of this team will discuss policies and practices that child welfare systems and other organizations are putting in place to support birth parents and foster parents in working together to promote the well being and stability of children and youth who are under care. So our panelists today will share experiences in building and supporting meaningful partnerships and discuss how children and youth are more likely to thrive when the important adults in their lives collaborate with each other and share responsibilities and decision making. I'll now get to hand it off to Sophia. And do, am I right in thinking Sophia is going to be handing it off to Robin? <laughs> well, Go ahead, Robin. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Robbins and I am a foster resource parent from Northern California for the last 20 years. And I am a proud member of the Birth and Foster Parent Partnership, which you are going to be able to hear about in our next presentation. So welcome everybody. And I am going to, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our agenda. We're gonna try really hard to get some great stuff into this small amount of time. Um, because we've been sharing these workshops uh, nationally for a while with some of the same information. Mm -hmm. So I just, I really want to thank, I love saying this acronym, I really want to thank CASHU um, for letting us have this opportunity. And of course, I was astounded and moved by my colleagues, um, Sharonda and Katie, sharing their story in their vulnerable ways, but also their, their hope for and their actual practical experience of how we can make relationships work um, with what we have in place already. So that's the exciting news. I love working with the disruptors, Sharonda, and I'm super happy to be working with the leaders um, of, of people with lived experience that I'm involved with now. So thank you to also um, QPI and uh, Dr. Lewis for finally putting some, we're, we're happy to get some ac actual research. I know there's other research, but we know research drives change. And this is what we're doing is we're changing how people have been working with relationships in the child welfare system. So this is all very exciting. And uh, this is my chance to really share with my colleagues a passion that has been mine for, for many, many years. So I'm going to move on and let you get to know um, the presenters, my incredible presenters who are here today, we'll have each of you say a little bit about just who you are. We're going to move kind of fast here. We have a minute, but um, let, how about I start with you, Paula? Do you want to introduce yourself to folks? Well, absolutely. I would love to introduce myself to everyone. Hello, my name is Paula Bibb Samuels. I am a birth parent and also a kinship placement individual. And so my role here is as a birth parent and a kinship individual with lived experience. And why, I wanna let you know why partnership is important to me. Partnership is important to me because partnership is like a girdle. And those of you who know me a little bit know how I feel about a girdle. A girdle helps to keep everything in place and it smooths out the rough edges. <clears throat> Excuse me. A girdle is support. And so partnerships provide support and they smooth out the rough edges and they are able to make that person's core better. And that's why partnership is important to me. So I believe I'll just pass it on to Marquis. I don't know how I can follow that, but <laughs> good morning all. My name is Marquita King. And for the last 12 years, my husband and I have been fostering with the ARC Northern Chesapeake region in Maryland. We're also adoptive parents. I've been a member of BFPP for four years, and I think these types of relationships are important because they directly affect how well the reunification of the foster child to their family plays out. I think foster parents can definitely be reassuring to birth parents while their children are away from them. And we can be supportive in helping them to resolve any issues so their children can return home as quickly as possible. So these partnerships are extremely important. Um, Jody, over to you. Hey everybody, my name is Jody Rogers. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I am from Sonoma County, California. And I am also a member of the Birth and Foster Parent Partnership as well as the Birth Parent National Network. 
And I want to say, um, so how I got to be here when I think, why am I here? So I am a mother whose children were removed at one point and walked through reunification in my own life. And so I use that lived experience. And today I am a birth parent mentor. So I get to be a support to parents going through the child welfare system. Um, and so when I think why is partnership important to me, this is really, and try to keep it short. It's hard to follow. I love Paula's girdle story. It's like my favorite, her scenario of that. But um, because everybody involved deserves that because it's the most human thing that we can do is work together, no matter what role you're in, whether you're a social worker, a resource parent, a foster parent, a birth parent, or the child, when we all work together, that's when we truly see the healing happen. And so I think that is why it's important to me. And I will pass this back to Robin. Thank you, Jody. And I also want to sort of identify that Jody and I came come from the same county and we work together as a team. Um, so she, Jody's my local partner. We are a birth parent, foster parent team. And we have been doing this work together since I first met her several years ago when at that point she wanted to get out of the room as fast, fast as possible when she saw me there. And now I think that would be pretty much the opposite. We are working together beautifully. So this is a power team you have in front of you right now. I wish you had more more time to hear everything that's going on, but I think I'll start with a quick run through of the agenda if we're ready for that slide. There it is. We've done our welcome. And once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for staying through the next uh, however long we have, 50 minutes, and really li listening to us talk about our shared experience of what's actually happening. We aren't going to share with you a new idea or a whole new thing you have to read and study and, and figure out. We're going to share with you actual experience and how it is really working for families and staff members and social workers. So um, our welcome. We are going to share three quick workshop Goals. I'm going to try to get a little bit of information in about the BFPP, and then we'll move to our relationship guide. We will have resources at the end that are fabulous so for you to uh, take home or look up, but um, we'll see how much time we have for questions. We'll, that may have to happen later um, in a, a parking lot situation, but we're looking forward to that. So what I'm going to do with the next slide is uh, turn it over to Marquita to talk about our workshop goals. Go ahead, Marquita. Okay, so we have three goals that we hope to accomplish during today's workshop. Our first goal is to increase your understanding of the birth and foster parent partnership movement. If you're not already a part of the BFPP movement, we hope that you will gain a better understanding of what we're all about. We are committed to making changes in the way birth and foster parents and kinship caregivers and staff can work together to build long lasting relationships to help support the children and their families. We hope you will join us in this exciting movement. Our second goal is to introduce you to the two tools that the BFPP members developed. The first tool is a relationship building guide and the second tool is a state and local leaders guide to building a strong policy and practice foundation. We hope in turn that you will get ex as excited about these tools like we are and take them back into your own communities and states and help us in building these important relationships that shift attitudes, policies, and practices. Today, we will be talking more in depth about the relationship building guide as this will help provide you with a better understanding of how we can build these re uh, important relationships between birth parents, foster parents, kinship caregivers, and staff. Our third and final goal is to share BFPP resources with all of you and explain how to access them at the Children's Trust Fund Alliance website, which is ctfalliance.org slash partnering dash with dash parents slash BFPP. So up next, we'll have Robin share some background about the development of the BFPP and the two tools. Robin, over to you. Thank you, Marquita. And uh, those websites will be available to you to see. Um, you won't have to memorize them, but we want to keep asking you to reach out and look at what we have on the website. 
So here we are, here's my family. And this, this picture does not um, have all of us there. This picture was of one of the first times we met in person at the Birth and Foster Parent Partnership in Seattle. And I just really want to um, share that we had three amazing organizations work together collaboratively to give us this opportunity. And they were the Casey Family Programs, the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, and the Quality Parenting Initiative, which you just heard about all got together and decided what would happen if we put birth parents and foster parents together in the same room. Well, you can see in this picture what happened. In fact, we didn't pay that much attention to which role we had by the time we were done. We were focused together uh, to do the work of giving families the support they need for, for more than reunification, for lasting relationships, no matter what happens in a, a family situation. So we have been working nationally to create practice policy and, and uh, legislation, hopefully, and, and anything we can to bring these practices into our local communities and also any, in our statewide and national and regional areas, anywhere that we can get you to listen. And by the way, if I may just say, I'm pretty excited to have the opportunity to actually being listened to the people who do the work that you do because you are working so hard and so busy that even as a foster parent, it was hard to find time to do what everybody needed to have done in a case. So it's been really exciting to have this opportunity to share with, with the people who are working so hard to make children's lives better. So thank you for being here. So I am going to um, also tell you, oh yes, of course, why we're here, that in the process of doing all the different work in all the different areas as uh, parent partners and foster parents and kinship caregivers, we also have had uh, the opportunity to create the tools you're going to hear about today. And these tools are just a format. They have information that is helpful in trying to cross those silos, get across that barrier that we have which I believe is artificially in place between birth parents and foster parents, but it's really a solid barrier that's been there for a long time. So we created these tools. And when I say we, we had the support of the organizations and we all, but we, what you see in the tools was written by people, uh, parents and caregivers, um, and, and you'll see quotes and all sorts of wonderful things in them. So we have two wonderful tools. Let's see if I can uh, hold mine up. So I never go anywhere without my birth and foster parent tool. And if we are, since we already talked about our secret girdle, we can also say I get called Vanna White because um, this has really changed my life. So you see the tools here. Um, I, the, the, I wanted to describe which was which. The Birth and Foster Parent Partnership State and Local Leaders Guide to Building a Strong Policy and Practice Foundation. That particular guide is going to be helpful to agency workers who are trying to create an environment for these relationships to grow and to, to be safe and to uh, fit within all the the laws and the um, boundaries that are in place right now. So that is a wonderful resource for folks who really wanna make a difference. The Birth and Foster Parent Partnership Relationship Building Guide you'll hear more about today. This has was written by uh, folks with lived experience and it, it has some great strategies, hands-on strategies for those of you who can um, uh, use them right now. And in a situation, you can give them to parents, you can give them to uh, foster parents, you can hand them over to your division director. <laughs> you can pull out a chart and work on it, but you'll see more about that in a bit. And then in the middle, you see the executive summary, which talks just a little bit about what I've been sharing about the BFPP and the tools and what the work we're doing. So those are just some of the tools that we have in our resources for you. So I am going to, um, let's move to the next slide. See if I left anything out about this. So next, uh, this slide touches my heart, and this is a very uh, long quote by a man who we sadly lost last year, but this is my friend Luke and Jody's friend Luke with his amazing little, little guy. Um, and I'm going to turn this time over to Paula to talk about some of what's going on with her locally and her work, whether it be local or not. Uh, just to let you know that we are all over this country. We've been doing this work for several years. So this she'll share her story of what she thinks these partnerships could really do to um, improve systems. I'm ready for you now, Paula, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Robin. Well, here in Texas, cause I did not tell y'all where I was from when I introduced myself because you know, 
everything is bigger in Texas. And I felt like you should just automatically know because this personality comes through the screen. But here in Texas, I have been working with another agency called Arrows, and they are an adoption agency, a foster care slash adoption agency. And what we've done is we have presented the tools, the, the wonderful tools that Robin showed. And, you know, because I have my background up, you can't really see it, maybe sneak up on it, that I keep with me as well. And so what we've done, we have presented to their, like their directors, the the high level staff or upper level staff. And they loved it. They loved the idea of what we were trying to promote because we think relationships are very important. And we understand that when a child and a family has support from birth uh, with, when you have the birth family, the foster family and or kinship family involved and everybody's working toward the same goal and that in the relationship is built, then a community is enlarged. And we know that, you know, I know in our community, we say it takes a village to raise a child. And so we need that community, that village in order to help raise these children that may have been temporarily, and that is our hope that they are temporarily have entered into care. And so we presented to Arrows, we presented to their, you know, like board of directors, and they loved it. So then we presented to their staff as well, because again, they loved it. And now we're just working on a date and time, you know, with COVID kind of coming back, we're having to readjust some things, but we are uh, trying to find a date and time to present not only to more staff, but also to the parents that are involved. And that's your birth parents, your foster parents, and your kinship parents, and your adoptive parents, potential adoptive parents. They want us to present these tools to them because they understand that regardless of the outcome, if a child or a family, and I have to say that child or children, if they are able to enlist or to have this supportive circle around them, that girdle, then they are more likely than not to be successful, even if they have to remain out of the home. But again, our goal is that the that the removal is temporary. And so then when these children are returned home, then they are able to still continue that support that came from a foster parent or a kinship placement. Because again, we need the girdle. We need something that holds us together, smooths out the rough edges, and supports us in those times of need. And so that's what we've been doing here in Texas. And we're continuing to try to promote this work all over the world. But the United States is our goal. I believe, I believe that I'm going to pass this back to Robin, who will now facilitate a more in-depth discussion on the content that's included in your relationship building guide. Robin, go for it. Thank you very much, Paula. And once again, I wish you could see or hear or understand the actual work these amazing leaders I'm here with today are doing in their area. And just notice the differences. You know, I know a lot of folks ask questions of, you know, have, has there been a difference in the reunification rate? and those kinds of things. And we are working, everybody's working, um, all the agencies to really get that information down. But in the meantime, as Katie said so importantly, uh, we can't wait. We can't wait, families can't wait, children can't wait. And when I started my work as a foster parent 20 years ago, I, I never had the intention of adopting. My husband and I were there to support the system and to support families. But we were started with that idea, that mindset, that we needed to be careful and we need to be safe and stay away from these people because if they could have hurt their child, then, you know, how how safe would they be around us? And that's that was the really sort of um, embedded way our system shared. But we got past that pretty fast. And one of the ways we did it, also Jennifer Rodriguez shared, um, we did it without having that social worker saying, yes, okay, go do this, this is okay. We did what needed to be done to keep families and children together, but it, it was very uncomfortable. We wanna be here working as a team. So fast forward to where we are now, we have a fabulous local um, QPI run partnership in our agency. It's actually one of the uh, departments in our agency where we work together as a team with foster and birth parents to, uh, support a family and we look together as a team at what families need and then people with lived experience, people, Jody, who's walked in the path of these parents and myself, who's been the foster parent in this county so long, 
for example, can give a family the support they need and really hear what they need. So you have no idea how far this can go. And so we're going to look at the birth and foster parent partnership guide today, but you'll keep hearing me. This is my form of the girdle, um, which I love that you shared because I've, all the folks here, all 530 some folks are going to remember that. They're just going to remember that. So when you remember the girdle, maybe somehow you can uh, attach it to this uh, wonderful guide that we have to share with you. And this particular guide, the birth and foster parent partnership relationship building guide has the tools within it. Um, I, I don't think we have a slide showing it, but what we did with this guide, all the folks who um, created it, is uh, put four charts covering four separate areas that felt like a chronological way a family might go through the system. But it's important that you know that any of these areas, when you look at these tools, any of these areas um, can be used separately or at any point in a case. So for instance, here's chart number one. And don't worry, we don't expect you to be able to read this. This is just sort of a, your memory will um, see this in your mind when you open the one. If hopefully some of you have the tools already, but if you don't, when you do uh, get a chance to see them, you'll see chart number one. And so the four charts we're about to give you a little bit of experience. We wish we had more time to really share um, what's going on with each of these, but we're gonna give you a short experience of each of the charts. And what you can do here with these charts is you can pull one of these ideas out, you can um, ask the foster parent to look at it and say, which one of these do you think would be a good way to start a conversation? But you can pull one of these charts out separately and take it to a staff meeting and, and have people have a conversation there. You can send different charts depending on what's going on with the family or what maybe you want your supervisor to hear or what work you're doing with a particular caregiver or a kinship caregiver where you think this might be helpful. So this tool is very flexible and uh, I think it's you're going to be interested and excited and see what it can do. So chart number one, are you ready, Jody? I'm going to call on my partner, my um, my other half, huh? I don't know if my how my husband feels about that, but we've been partnering pretty wonderfully for the last several years, and we have seen changes in families, and we have seen successes. So what we're going to do right here is uh, talk about the first chart you see, building the relationship. Because as you heard from Jennifer and QPI talking about comfort calls and initial relationships, the sooner you can start this relationship, the better. And we're working against some tough odds. We're working with families that are in pain for a lot of reasons. And then on top of that, they have the added um, trauma of losing their children. So there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of discomfort. And then you have the foster family or the kinship giver, caregiver. You have these people who also are, their lives are in flux about what's going to happen next. So we, we really stand by starting this relationship at the very beginning, as soon as possible. Now, remember, if you haven't had a chance to do that, you can do this building the relationship anywhere it's needed. Sometimes you need to do it more than once and shore up a relationship. But um, so Jody, should we talk a little bit about the case we had with a mom named Laura um, and, and a little bit about how you helped make my experience and Laura's experience and ultimately the infant, her son, um, so much more possible by our initial relationship building? Yes. Um, so what was really different about this case is that Robin and myself, we, we met back at the convening that was mentioned earlier uh, with the three agencies. And we, we just thought to ourselves, what would it look like if we were able, me as the birth parent mentor and Robin as the foster parent, to really wrap a family in support? And so we came back from that convening and went to our agency and asked for their blessing on this, on piloting a partnership case. And so we got the go ahead. And so what was really different about this, this mom, it was a mom, Robin got a placement for a baby and um, let me know. But this time, so I usually meet parents at their very first court hearing, which we call here the detention hearing. I was able to walk up to this mom and sit down next to her, and I was able to share with her what I knew about the woman that was caring for her child. I was able to share with her things like, this woman wants to be a part of helping your family heal, um, little things like that. And I was really able to like plant a seed between the two, 
so that when that first visit did happen, like I was also able to go back with Robin and say like, mom is really motivated. Like she's already seeking, getting support with treatment. And, and what that did was it, it paved the way for, for Robin to push harder. Like, Hey, this visit needs to happen. I'll supervise. And what was really awesome that, that lives in my heart is that when the two mothers first met, I remember birth mom running up to Robin and just wrapping her arms around Robin and saying, thank you so much for all you do. And so when we're talking about building the relationship, it can be a really creative thing. Using your resources, using your community partners, using just whatever it is that you have out there to use to really start that foundation because children thrive when the adults in their lives are working together as one unit. And like when Paula refers to the girdle, I love that. I love that because for me, it just, it really helps me put everything into perspective, you know? And that's what Robin and I got to do for this specific mother is we got to wrap around her and just hold her. And she got to heal because of that process. Thank you, Jody. And we could uh, write a book about this particular case. In fact, we've shared about it before. As we move on to the next chart, um, I just want to let you all know that this mama who came into our care had lost three other children to the system and was on track to lose this one as well. And um, because the social workers involved and the supervisors sat down and listened to what we wanted to do, we just wanted to create an environment for, for a relationship to happen, which really didn't mean putting things in place. Most of the time it meant yeah. removing barriers. Like, okay, you don't have to wait till you have the right supervisor there. You can put two people in a room together and they're really gonna be okay. Um, and that's what happened in this case. So fast forward four years and lots of work. We're still supporting. I believe we probably each got a call from this mom sometime this week, Jody, and this is um, this little guy's four years old and he was medically fragile and had a lot of surgeries and mom is doing great. She not only has this child as a four-year-old and a job and is helping other parents, but she has her other children back that she had lost. So really it turned out all she needed was a little bit of support and a change in the mindset of this this particular social worker was very supportive. She was willing to step out of the way. And before we go into our role play, I wanna say the social worker in this case, I remember very profoundly said, this was one of my easiest cases. Robin and Jody did all the work. Now she's not talking about the paperwork and the legal stuff and all the, all the court issues. She's talking about the work of relationship building and visits and making sure the children are getting what they need and the families as well. So it was a really powerful experience. And we're, the other part is I have these families in my life now that are helping me and, and make enriching my life. So that was a great example. Chart number two moves on to supporting the relationship. And I think this is a key area which we do not have time to really go into in depth. We're going to share with you a role play. I know all of you probably know about role plays, but I'm going to encourage you to look at one of these charts and or some of the information in the guide, pull out a situation and try it on. We, we need systems change. We need QPI and we need the Alliance and, and Casey Family Programs to and all the researchers to get out there and make this change happen. But in the meantime, try it on. Just take one of these and say, okay, you be this person, you be this person, and let's see what happens. Really helpful when I'm training foster parents to do these role plays. So chart number two is about supporting the relationship. In my experience, that's really about communication, exchanging information, how that's going to happen, and when that's going to happen. And hopefully it's building on that relationship you built, you already have in a start to with your comfort calls and your initial meetings. So we are going to do a quick role play. Usually we don't move through it this fast. Um, we have not rehearsed this, have we, Jody? Jody's going to be the birth parent. Um, I'm going to be the foster parent in this case, um, which I wasn't expecting. So this is really going to be some uh, real life happening in front of you. And the only thing I ask that is that, Sophia, you <laughs> stop me in time if we keep going. Um, so let's see, I am going to 
uh, read about what the, I've lost my place in pages, can you tell? I'm going to um, set up the role play, and then we're just going to talk a couple minutes about what would be happening. So this is, here it is, I'm so sorry. This is um, Jody being the birth parent and me being the foster parent, although you don't have to have your role play have the actual roles. And um, what's happening in our situation. So you ready, Jody? I'm moving from facilitator to real life here. So the birth parent runs into the visit out of breath and late for her visit for the second time. The foster parent asks the social worker if she can talk to the birth parent for a minute at the end of the visit. Okay. So, <sighs> hey, Jody, how'd it go? Look at this little one. He seems pretty happy. Oh yeah, um, it was good. It was really, it was good. He's, you know, our visits always go really good. I, I miss, I miss him so much. Yeah, and you know, I'm sorry to see you miss part of this visit too, but I'm glad you got here in time. But um, I'm noticing that seems to be, you know, a problem for you. And the and the rules we have in place here are if you're late to a visit three times in a row, um, they have to reevaluate the visits and where they are and how they're happening. And it's, it's a lot of, um, more. So um, uh, uh, what do you think is going I'm on? So sorry. Listen, Robin, I'm really sorry. Okay. I'm really, please don't stop my visits. It's so, all I have to hang on to. Please don't take my visits. It's all I have. I'm, I'll do better. I'm so sorry. I'll do better. Okay. You know, you were working so hard, Jody. You are wanting to be a parent to this baby and these visits. Look how happy he is having been held by you. He he knows your smell and your touch and and he really needs time with you too. So so I'm wondering if we could maybe look at um, what's going on with the visit and how you're getting here. Maybe you can talk to the social worker about it. What what's being what is so hard about showing up at a certain time at the visit? Um I'm scared. I'm scared to get in trouble for saying this. I don't, I don't want to be irresponsible. I don't want to be in trouble. Um, Wait. Are you going to tell on me? Yeah, I was just going to say, you can go ahead and, and, and talk to me about this. If there's something I think the social worker needs to know about what's going on with your case, I need to be able to share. But, you know, maybe we could work together with that once uh, we have a better idea of what will work in your visits or what might be better for you so you don't always have to be rushing. And then we could talk to the social worker together and see what we can do to put a solution here so that you do have the chance to Robin, be with I us. Don't, I this visit is 15 miles from town. Like I don't have money. I walk around all week and like picking up change off the ground to get here. I ran out of gas on my way here and ran the rest of the way. I don't have the money, but if I tell the workers that they're gonna think, oh, she definitely can't care for her kids. I'll, I'll leave earlier, I'll figure it out. Jody, I saw you work so hard to be here today. I am, I'm just feeling really sad that this is so hard for you to even get to the visit because it's hard enough to do everything else you're working on with your life and, and also being a parent to this little one. Um, and I think maybe there might be some support for you about transportation that you haven't found out about yet. So, so that's definitely worth asking the social worker about. And I, I can help you do that if that would be a good thing to do for you. We could talk to her about bus passes or changing to the other location, which I think might be easier for you to get to for the visit. And I would not mind moving there if that's really what we need to do or what the social worker decides. But um, you shouldn't have to add... I just feel like I want to do whatever they want. I just feel like I just don't want to ask anything. And I just want to show them that I'm a good mom and I can take care of my kids. And I'm really not the monster that it says I am in that report. Like, I love my kids, Robin. I'm scared. I just, I'm a good mom. I'm a, I love my kids and, and they love me. And I just want to show them I can do this. I'm scared to ask for help. I'm scared to tell them that I don't have money because and then it just makes me look even more like I can't care for them. Well, I think that everybody here is really wanting to focus on you and your baby being together, but it may not look like that right now. And it's so it must be so scary and on top of all the pain of not holding that baby. 
Um, I'm wondering, how would you feel if I asked the social worker if I could come in at the beginning of the visit for a little while and be there with you and, and help the baby get used to you? And then you'll always know that I'm there um, and you'll see me and if I'll, I can wait in the lobby or whatever works out so that when you when you get here, you, you don't have to spend so much of your time calming down and being afraid and worrying about things. We can just sit and talk about your baby a little bit. What do you think? Do you think my son's not used to me anymore? No, I think this is our chance for, for me to get a, a good look at how he reacts to you and how you hold him and how you parent him so I can know what you like doing when, when you have to be apart with him. So we're really working on figuring out how our two different ways of parenting are going to be best for your son. Uh, but the visit, I think you just, he just wants you to hold him and love him and be with him. So let's figure it out. Let's figure out talking to the social worker and maybe doing things a little bit differently so that getting to the visit isn't your biggest focus or a reason why you have to be afraid to talk to your social worker. So we'll, we'll work together to figure this out. Okay. I mean, could you ask for the visits to be closer? Well, I think that um, as a team, as working together, we could we can communicate with your social worker. She is really willing to help you, and we can I can definitely be part of that conversation. But I think that it's important that you get a chance to say how you feel and what's going on. So let's try to just try to figure out how to make that happen too, that we can all be working together. Okay. Okay. Um, I need to go now and I am going to take your baby and, um, but he's your baby. And like we said before, if you need me to shoot you a text or a picture, whenever, now that we're in person again, that's great. But I know you need to know what's going on with him more often. And I'm more than happy to do that for you. So um, thank you for listening to me. I, I think we can work this out. So everybody's feeling a lot more comfortable. Okay. What do you think? Okay. Okay. Um... All right. Let's talk some more next time, all right? I'll, I'll, see, you, I'll see you in a couple days. Okay, thank all you. All right, thanks for trying to be here on time and um, I'll be there waiting for you with your son and we'll have, we'll have a good visit together, okay? Thank you. All have right. Have a good day. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. So this, this is just one of our role plays. It, it, I didn't end up in tears in this one because I'm not usually facilitating and role playing but, or watching time, but... Um, Jody has brought me to tears many times. And um, what I didn't mention, I should have, is that when you're going to be using role plays for any of these charts or any of the work between anybody, they can be very sensitive and bring up um, hard feelings too um, at the time. And, and it's so that we can practice being with emotions and feel more um, grounded in what we're going to do or how we can be there for each other. Um, I know there's a lot of focus on helping foster parents being there for birth parents. But um, I think my partners, my foster parents would agree with me, the leadership that I work with and the local ones, that we get so much out of these relationships. When we open our hearts and our ideas and our minds, and in some cases, even our doors to the families that we're working with um, and, and intentionally think about, I loved that word everybody used, intentionally think about how to create relationship for the children's sake. Um, things are easier for everybody. Visits get easier. Um, so, you know, it, just the um, co court process gets easier when a family knows they have support. We've created so many teams around some, so many families that had positive outcomes that, um, that, you know, it's just obvious that the, the missing piece here is relationships. So that is chart number two. Chart number two will give you ideas for communication. It will incorporate the information sharing that, that older children and parents need. But be really um, mindful about trying things a little bit differently, just a little bit. Try it with one case. Try it with um, a role play with maybe a foster parent who isn't understanding um, what birth parents are going through. So Okay, that is, um, I don't know if anybody else, Jody, did you want to say anything else? Yes, I want to ask you how that role play was for you. I almost walked right over that. I'm sorry, hon. You talk a little bit about this role play and how you feel about chart number two. So on um, the role plays are not um, rehearsed. And so I chose not to really um, even see like the stage being set until in the moment. 
but that hit home for me that that I I started to like really feel that because uh that was a scenario that played out during my case with my own children except I never had anybody come up to me and ask me hey what's going on and the truth really is that I didn't have money for gas and that I did run out of gas every week. And I did spend my week picking up change off the ground to see whatever I could manage to put in my gas tank, you know? And so um, I found myself really getting emotional, but I also, I find it so healing to be able to go back into a situation that I actually lived through and needed that support with and to be able to have that. Um, I think at some point I wasn't really role playing as, as I felt like I was actually, it was happening, you know, and um, it felt good to have somebody ask like, hey, what's going on? Let's work this out, you know, and I, I, I found Mama Bear a little defensive in some places when, when you said, Robin, I'm leaving with, and I'm taking your child. I was like, <laughs> you know, but um. You really held this strong boundary, which I think is good. And you opened a door for me to be able to say that to somebody. Somebody noticed and somebody cared. And you didn't let that third visit happen where my visits got canceled. And so for me, it was that opportunity to go back and let a piece of me heal from my past. That's pretty amazing, Jody. We're sort of think I'm thinking about a blend of all sorts of cases like this that have happened in my experience. But in this particular role play, uh, what I notice is the piece that was added that wouldn't have been there normally was the social worker saying, sure, you can talk a little bit at the end of the meeting. And, and that was a simple thing. And um, I was given the trust and respect and, and to work with uh, Jody and be there with her as well. So it may take just a little bit of change to start and try on these relationships to really make a big difference for families. So I um, think I forgot to um, read when I was talking about the tools, but you can do this for yourself when you look at the tools, the names of the four charts. So chart one was building the relationship about the initial relationships starting from the beginning. And then building on that, supporting the relationship talks about the different ways that we can have birth and caregiver uh, relationships be um, set up in a way that there's good communication and it changes. So it goes up and down. We definitely have a roller coaster in each of these charts. But now we're going to talk about the third chart, which focuses on keeping the relationship strong while working with the system and planning for reunification. And um, this particular uh, chart was important to me because as a foster parent, I wasn't always allowed to do this kind of support. So little by little, my um, the county where I work really is open to this partnership and they um, allow us to really share, here's how it was for me, here's what's going to work, and maybe I can go sit at court with you. Um, and it really changed the whole mindset of everybody involved and it shifted the, the case towards reunification. So I'm going to turn this chart over to back to you, Paula, and I see once again, I'm not really sure what you're going to share, but um, wait, are we there for you yet? Are you chart number three? Yeah, yes. nod your head, Paula. Okay, I couldn't tell I if you were frozen or not. Sorry, I was just wondering if you were frozen. So you're going to share a little bit about maybe one of the strategies from the tool or something that you've used in this area of supporting families through the, the navigation of the system. Go ahead. I'm, Thank I'm you. Thank you very much, Robin. Well, my actual experience, um, as I stated before, I, I'm a kinship, I was a kinship placement, and my experience was nothing like what we are trying to get across and to share with you all. And actually, as a kinship placement, I knew the family. So we already had relationship, but the caseworker in, in our case didn't like the birth family at all, period. And so she, what I felt like she was doing was sabotaging the relationship. Like she would tell the birth mother, like your child is never gonna come home with you. But I never agreed to keep the child. Did Listen, I already had child welfare uh, involvement. Didn't I want them in my life? Not another moment. And so why in the world would I agree to taking this child on until he aged out of care? But anyway, and I told them that at the beginning, but she was telling the birth parents, you know, you'll never get your child again. That child is going to forever be with Paula. And the birth mother would tell the son that I had in care. 
which caused a lot of friction in my home. And then it caused a lot of friction between the birth mother and I. I, I never was really involved with the birth father. He was a little odd. And so I just, you know, chose to deal with him with uh, kid gloves. But the mother and I did have relationship. And so it caused a lot of friction and it caused that tension. And actually it caused tension between the child who was in my home and my birth children. It was a lot of stuff that we had to deal with because the caseworker chose not to follow any of these principles. Maybe she was not aware. That's the whole goal here is we're trying to make people aware because in keeping that relationship strong, it says while working with the system and planning for reunification. So we should always plan for reunification if it is safe to do so. And when you do that, then you don't exclude, you don't isolate, you don't, you don't put that as a part of your relationship. And so that was like era number one, two, three, four, five through a thousand. Okay. And so what I did though, is when I found out what was going on with the caseworker is I had a conversation and I said, listen, I don't want this child. I love this child, and but I do not want to care for this child for the remainder of his life. If his parents can get it together, this child deserves to go home, period. She didn't like it. I started going to court with the birth mother because like I said, the father didn't really do it. I started going to court with the birth mother. And when the judge would say, do, does anyone have anything to say? I would say, yes, sir. You know, mom came to every visit. Mom did this. I'm like the cheerleader for mom because mom, to my knowledge, was doing absolutely everything she knew to do in order to get her child back in her home. That's what we have. That's what this partnership is about is you become a support system. There was nothing like when I was a younger kid and to see my mom on the sidelines yelling and cheering for me. And I did the very same thing for my children, even turned round offs because I still can at 47. So you always need that support. And that's what we're trying to get across here is that this is not a separate thing. Birth parent is separate from uh from by uh sorry, not bio, from adopted parents or foster parents or kinship parents. We're all in this thing together and we have to work it like we're all in it together. And so I actually used these tools before I knew what these tools were. And now that we have written information on these tools, we can expound on them and we can continue to use them. And I promise you, if you use these tools in every case that you have, whether you be a foster parent, a caseworker, and I don't know if there are any birth parents on here, but if everybody would use these tools, we would see a change in that child welfare system. And Robin, you mentioned change. We have to be ready for change. We can't ask permission for change. So some birth, some foster parents where they're still trying to seclude the foster parent from the birth parent, you may have to figure out a creative way to follow the rules, but to implement this change. Because I don't ever want to tell anyone to break the rules because it can be very detrimental to the case. So what we're talking about here is keeping the relationship strong while continuing to work with the system and a plan for reunification. That's where everybody, everybody in this family is working toward reunification. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Robin. I think I'm done. Thank you. And you're long from done. You're, there's gonna be a lot of workshops for Paula and other, these other amazing people and our disruptors, Sharonda and Katie. We are all members of the BFPP and we are looking anywhere and everywhere that we can share this work. Um, and thank you, Paula, for pointing out um, the positives of what's going on here. And we are, I think a lot of folks are in a, a place where they are changing what's expected from foster parents um, to be a part of the family. And it is a change, but I do believe that those of you who are here today have a lot of um, power to really help that change because some of it is just a mindset change. A culture change requires a mindset change. And, and that's something we can all do. So I'm excited to uh, be part of the work that you're doing, Paula and Marquita. And we are probably running out of time. Let's move to chart number four. Um, as a foster parent, I love this chart. And it's something we talk about. I often hear, oh, if you have a relationship with the family, then you can babysit afterwards. It is so, there is so much more to it than that story. Um, it's so much more for, you know, because these families become my family. I become their family. We connect in a way that is the way humans connect. And it's through your heart and it's about love. And those are uncomfortable things for, for folks in the system to talk about. So I'm going to turn this over now to Marquita to talk about a really wonderful um, 
system, uh, sorry, I looked away, a really wonderful story, um, which I believe our stories are the most powerful anyway, um, about when she did work on keeping the relationship strong after the birth family left. So Marquita, why don't you go ahead? And then Jody, you'll, you'll finish up this section. Okay, thanks Robin. So one of the strategies listed in chart four for keeping the relationship strong is to let the birth parent know that you're available to them even after reunification. You can share with them that you'd like to keep in touch via phone and um, even swap pictures. So a few years ago, I got a call that the distraught grandfather of a kid placed in my home was picketing out front of our county courthouse. He was carrying this huge sign, hoping that the judge would grant him permission to have his grandson for Christmas. I wouldn't have been so concerned if he hadn't written the name of his grandson on the sign for everybody to see. Everyone I called said he had a right to be there. Well, I felt differently. His grandson could end up teased if a classmate or anyone else in the community saw his name on the sign. So, you know, in retrospect, it's hard to believe that this child had been with me over six months and I had never met the grandfather who was a potential placement. Had I been introduced to the concept of BFPP and trained on the tools, this scenario may have never happened or I would have felt less nervous approaching him. So scared, nervous, and not knowing what to do, I grabbed my coat, my purse, and a roll of duct tape on my way out the door. I was on a mission. I dashed across the parking lot trying to spot him, not even knowing what he looked like. I walked up to him and verified his name, introduced myself, and let him know that I was concerned that his grandson's name was on the sign for all the community to see. He spoke a couple of sentences and invited me to come sit in a coffee shop around the corner out of the blustery cold. He talked, I listened. He laughed, I laughed. He cried and showed me pictures for two and a half hours. All he needed was someone to listen, a shoulder, an ear. Well, he realized that his picketing wasn't in the best interest of his grandson, so he decided to leave. He was so embarrassed to even carry the sign with his grandson's name on it back um, to his car. So I surprised him when I reached in my purse and I pulled out a roll of duct tape, which was the exact width to cover his grandson's name. We laughed and he said, Miss King, you did what even my wife couldn't do. Talk me off the corner. He had planned on picketing for a week in extremely cold weather. Folks, families are desperate to get their kids back and children are aching to go home. Well, his grandson was reunified with him three years ago, but we still keep in touch. Actually, the child contacted me weekend before last to let me know that his dad had remarried and he proudly gave a tear-jerking toast at the reception. He even texted me the toast that he had so proudly written and sent me several pictures of the wedding. I got to boost his ego with praise on how handsome he looked in his fine suit. His grandfather has also invited our family to go on vacation with them in the mountains in the near future. It was heartwarming for him to invite us to travel with them. That's just how close we became. And using the tools, it affirms that these types of warm, intimate relationships can be formed and they can last for years to come. Jody, over to you for a quote. Yeah, so I wanna say, Marquita, I love when you share that story because, you know, it just really highlights for me how sometimes we can perceive something, kind of like me being late to visits or you, like you looking out and seeing this man that appears so angry and how easy those things are to see and judge. But then when we take that step and we actually humanize people how that just forms into just building these relationships. And I feel like um, that story that you just shared just really highlights the beauty that can happen 
when we really, we just humanize each other, right? The way we would, if it was our sister or our mother and we were exchanging our kids, it's all about those connections. And honestly, I'm gonna end with saying that why partnerships are so important regardless of outcomes, regardless of reunification, adoptions, guardianships, all of the outcomes out there, is that as long as it's safe, every child deserves to keep everybody in their life that they love. And with that, Robin, I will pass that back to you. Thank you, Jody. That one moves me every time. I think we can move to the next slide, um, but I am here to tell you that my life has really been nothing but um, enhanced by the relationships I have. So that focus on relationship from the very beginning can change the whole outcome of a case and really help everybody on the team uh, to have a better experience, even with the hard things we have to go through and to make sure children are safe and they aren't being taken away from their families. Um, so here are our, re our resources. I only have a couple minutes. Um, you can see the tools are available. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere without mine. The executive summary is a nice way to share with other people or just throw on your supervisor's desk, et cetera. Um, and then uh, there's a flyer that promotes the tools, handouts with recommendations on how to use the relationship building guide. Here I wanna point out that this guide does not cover some of the subjects you may wanna share, but you can use the guide and be flexible and make it yours by saying, okay, we're going to talk about communication, but we're going to, we're going to talk about culture and how it feels for you and your culture and, you know, talk about race equity. You can add all of these things and it's a very flexible tool. The handouts are separate. We're hoping that these videos will be available soon um, because we have videoed all of our workshops and the role plays, but I encourage you to go out and think of one little thing you can do outside of the box that really is going to make a difference to families everywhere because uh, it's just a little bit of perception, just giving that foster parent a minute, you know, 10 minutes with Jody or, or your Jody in your area. It's going to change how people think and it's going to change how they feel. And um, we, we're going to continue to build these relationships in a good way or not. So why not do it in a way that supports all of us? So these are, oh, and here's one of another one of our amazing birth parent leaders, Shauna. Um, so so in the, I won't read this, but in the tool, uh, tools, you will see a lot of quotes from birth parents, foster parents, um, kinship caregivers, and fo former foster youth. I think they're all former. Um, just talking a little bit about how relationships work for them. So this is one of my amazing mentors, Shauna here, who's also talking a lot about um, her particular uh, culture and, and works with QPI to really get the news out there and work on relationships. So we better keep moving because we're done, but I could talk about that forever. So I wanted to say, I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions and answers, but any questions you have or comments or anybody um, you want to speak with or, or talk further with, uh, you can get in touch with us with Sophia San Santiana's um, email at the Alliance. So the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And on that note, I really, really want to thank KC Family Programs, Quality Parenting Initiative, QPI, and the Children's Trust Fund Alliance for really making the birth and foster parent partnership possible for giving us the chance to really do the work we know can make a difference and to listen to us and to share our word and elevate our voice because it's already making a difference. Uh, we used to talk about how this is going to be great in the future and I'm here to say it's already happening. So I hope you, you uh, get a chance to look at these tools, try them on. If they don't work at first, try them again, share with other people, start conversations. And um, I also want to thank all of you who came out today or, or didn't come out, who sat in front of your computers, but still gave us your time to think about how relationships can change the lives of people and um, that you're working with and the reason you're there and go every day to help children be safe and be in families. So um, I think that's it. I don't know if anybody else has a comment from my team. I'm sure I didn't. I should thank my team, Sophia, and, and our people in the back and, and also Stacy. Um, and Cashew, um, what happened is uh, she attended one of our workshops. So if I may, I'm going to let you know, we have a fabulous workshop coming up in, in May on, two, uh, I think it's Monday, May 23rd at 12 
uh, Pacific time. But what's different about this one is it's going to be all dads, where dads are going to present. Dads are going to talk about the tools. They're going to talk about what it's like to be a dad in the system. And these are more of the leaders from our BFPP. So we hope you can join us. And I want to thank all my amazing presenters and all the support I got. And I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. But, you know, just think about what's that one little thing you can do? What's that small but important step you can take to uh, work towards relationship building? So thank you very much.